Welcome back to Happiness A Skeptic's Guide with self-confessed self-help abuser Paul Flower and me, psychologist and coach Gary Wood. On we go, sifting the science from the snake oil to find the things that just might make us all happier. Thank you for joining us in this latest episode of Happiness A Skeptic's Guide. We are bringing you a brief burst of happiness interrupted by inappropriate questions and inane jokes. Pretty much the same as usual then. And this is a second part of three on self-help. We'll talk a little bit in the next episode about self-help books, which is obviously a massive industry unto itself. But we are still concentrating at the minute on uh, the practical bits of how you can help yourself and how we can help you to help yourself. Are we? (laughs) (laughs) One would hope so. Okay, then. So I think in in the last one, we were talking about dear Samuel Smiles, who offers the prototypical self-help book. And one of the problems we have with self-help, it's knowing where to go and how to spot a good one and how to spot a bad one. So I thought, first of all, if we started to have a look at a little bit more about what are the warning signs that maybe this book isn't going to be for you. And the most important thing to talk about is the moralising, is that I recognise when I when I was looking at the formula for a self-help book, it's apparently eke it out as much as you can over five books and moralise as much as you can. And we see that a lot in this first 1859 self-help book, Samuel Smiles. He popularised the idea of the undeserving poor, which we saw a massive resurgence of in the financial crash. So the, this is kind of the moralising is where you're really talking about, you know, man and Superman to an extent. You yeah. are worthy. You can do this. You just need to wow, 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 wow. Well, it's self-help books are not so much as a books for the haves and the haves nots. They're often books for the haves to have a bit more. Yes. If we were to look at who would benefit most from self-help books, it's probably middle-class white straight people with lots of disposable income. But if you look at Samuel Smiles' books, and a lot of self-help books have mirrored this, there's this awful, you're going wrong in some way, there's something wrong with your character, is that anybody can make it, and all that kind of stuff. And when you start seeing that in books... And it's just like all it needs is some, you know, great British pluck or whatever brand of pluck, wherever you come from. Uh, then you know that you're in the the realms of moralising. And that's but, that's a warning I guess they're, sign. They're all going to do that, aren't they? I mean, realistically, they're going, none of them are going to go, yeah, the, you know, most success is gained by people who already have a little bit of success or have some backing, you know. Whenever we, ever we talk about Richard Branson, nobody talks about the initial money for Virgin coming from his grandmother or something, you know. And if he didn't have that, then maybe we wouldn't even know who Richard Branson was. You know, everybody wants to be the hero in their own life story, essentially. And so the people right Writing the self-help books are telling you all about how they were fantastic and what they had to do to break through and how you can do it as well with a bit more extra application. They're all going to do that. I don't think they are. I think if you look at some of the books that are based more in psychology, the techniques are going to be mediated or moderated by some of those factors in a way. And we always want to come back to the point that, you know, we we are here trying to sift the science from the snake oil. We're trying to give you the scientific stuff, the practical stuff that we believe will help. Yes. But if you see moralising in a book where it's it's somehow that you're you're a little bit defective then it's it's Put probably it down, throw it's it away well, no, well it's what well, treat it with a, a more than a spoonful of sugar a pinch of salt <laughs> I mean, it's like we saw in the covid didn't we if you can't write a novel now then time is not your problem if you don't seize this opportunity to take your business to the next level and you don't really want to be successful, if you yeah. can't learn a language or you can't write an opera or you can't have chisel abs <laughs> then it's something down <laughs> to you well, obviously, I managed the chiseled abs, but none of the other things. Uh, well, I'm sure you did. <laughs> I managed none of it. And, and I was asked to comment on the The phrase that we often use is toxic positivity. And it's the idea that we overemphasize the positive attitudes and positive thinking. And my view was during COVID, if sitting down, binge watching box sets and eating popcorn is the way you're going to get through it, then that is as productive as trying to write an opera. That's the way you're going to get through it. Sometimes it's not a nonsense. When we're stressed, we aren't creative. So that's where the psychology comes in. So we've we've dealt with stress. 
If we're stressed, we go into survival mode. You know, you've just come off Titanic. You're clinging to a bit of driftwood and you start going, I know, I'll write an opera. No, you just think, <laughs> is this piece of driftwood going to hold me? Oh, look, there's a bigger bit. Yeah, you're in the moment. You're trying to kind of focus very much on getting through it. And COVID is, is a great example because none of us had ever had that before in the, in terms of being put in our houses for such a long period of time, not knowing exactly when it was going to end. But actually, all we were trying to do was survive. Yes, it's a misnomer that we should all also be amazingly productive as well as surviving. And it psychologically doesn't make sense. So if a book's telling you, you know, if you're stressed, go out and write an opera or go out and build a business or go out and chisel your abs, then it, chances are it's not necessarily following psychology. During the lockdown, I was writing Psychology of Wellbeing. The deadline was looming. I was getting up at 6.30 of the morning and I was going to bed at 10 p.m. on night. Uh, well, I was finishing at 10 p.m. of a night and I worked all throughout the day. And on my break, I noticed this little gem and it said, in every day, there are 1,440 minutes. <laughs> that means you have 1,440 minutes daily opportunities to make a positive impact. And there was me at the time sitting on the lavatory thinking, now I feel guilty having a dump. And which, which was more important? Do I need to spread a little positivity or do I need to evacuate my bowels? And I would argue that the latter was more important to me at that point. And I didn't need to feel guilty about it. So you, you would consider that to be toxic positivity then, take, taking you out of the toilet, obviously. Well, um, but, you know, the fact that everybody's kind of, you know, everybody's adding up the minutes, the microseconds and saying you should be more. It's, it comes back to this productivity thing. So it, it, again, right back to Samuel Smiles, right back to the 1850, you know, the, the Victorian work ethic. The, the definition of toxic positivity is an ineffective and extreme overgeneralization of an optimistic, happy, positive state of mind in a given situation. So who in the middle of a pandemic is going to keep smiling, be cheerful and be productive all the time? And the answer was, if you are, that's probably more of a you know a reason to worry. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think of examples who were probably of people who were probably like that. Probably very rich people who were able to sleep on their own uh, piles of cash. Well, I didn't think they probably had to do anything, did they? I mean, we had lots of very rich people telling us, "I don't know anybody who's died," you know, sit, you know, from their mansions on the hill. Ivory mansion. I don't know any. This has happened to. Of course, you don't, because you know you, you can't see it from your window. Most of the time, though, it's just kind of just unrealistic. But it's other times it can be dangerous. So you think about when we start seeing these self-help books, a positive thinking can overcome all. Uh, when we extend that to illness, we think about medical treatments. You know, when you should be having proper medical treatment instead, you know, you're sticking a crystal up your you know, sacral chakra <laughs> and trusting in, the, trusting in the universe. No, get the medical treatments. If the positive thinking and the affirmations help, maintain a positive attitude and you know help boost your morale and make you feel better fine but it shouldn't be something that takes away from the science you know that we, we know what medical treatments work so if you start seeing books that say they can cure all ills just by thinking about it then you know you're onto a loser there yeah you've got somebody fake snake oil that is proper snake oil. that's the snake oil and we, we talked about last time um gurus and it was it was a bit of an eye opener when I realized that I've done some media stuff. And when a, the producer said to me, so this is your spot now. This is your chance to shine. And I'm going, you what? And I thought I was there in a kind of coaching supporting role for the main you know, protagonist in the story, the main person. But no, this was me for me to show off a little bit. And I felt really uncomfortable about this. And the producer actually said to me, whispered and said, and if you can make them cry, that's TV gold. And I was like, you what? And so it's this idea is it's entertainment, uh, essentially. A lot of this, this self-help stuff, when we see these reality TV shows or these talk shows, uh, you know, of these people fixing people's problems, it's exploitative of, often. It's often bullying, but it's there to entertain us. It's an extension of reality TV, isn't it? So these are real people's lives. Let's have a good laugh at them. Let's see, you know, what a mess they've made and let's feel a bit good about ourselves. Yeah, let, let's look at how inept they are and can they be transformed by this miracle worker? Yeah, that's exactly it. 
Because when, when you were talking about positive, um, uh, toxic positivity earlier, it was making me think that, you know, toxic positivity is almost the religion of our day or the biggest religion of our day. Now that popular religions are, are fading away, you know, and certain religions won't allow you to have, you know, when you were talking about uh, medicine and all the rest of it, certain religions won't allow you to have blood transfusions and whatever. You have to trust in God. It's almost a, an equivalent of that. You're giving out, your, you know, your prayers – and your positive thoughts and letting the universe take care of you and you're giving yeah, out... If you think something, it'll make it happen. Manifestation. And and there's nothing wrong with the, the, the wishful thinking. If it supports some concrete action, there's lots of evidence to suggest that, you know, if you're getting over serious illnesses, a positive attitude is important. Uh, but it's as in a supportive role, not in the leading role. So if you come across books that are telling you that the whole world can be changed just by you throwing up your hands to the universe, you're probably onto another bad one. Hmm. Do something. Take it back. Get a refund. It, this it seems almost like a bit of a downer on the old self-help books and self-help industry. There's another brand of book that's emerged. And I've been quite critical in my books of the whole self-help industry in looking at what works rather than what entertains. But there's a whole brand called the anti-self-help book now. So these are books that tell us not to read self-help books. And there's a, uh, there's one called, I can't, well, I actually can't say the title of the book, but it's... Uh, oh, I know which one you mean. Yes, F, yes. F, F it all. F asterisk asterisk K it. F it, the spiritual way. And it's 777 pages long. Now, I, I think if you don't f*** it after the first page, you'll probably never f*** <laughs> it at all. <laughs> and we're going to be bleeding those ones. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. You think, of, and, the, and there's also a, a, an effort retreat, and uh, there's an effort course. Yeah, it's be, these things become an industry if they if they're successful enough. And I suppose publishers throw as many of them as they can against the wall to see what sticks. The more successful they are, the more a sequel is required. Yes, isn't it? You know, it's like the film industry. If it's huge, you're going to be doing a second version, and if it's massive, you're going to be doing a third and fourth and you're going to put it into a psychology retreat and there's going to be a a holiday based on it or whatever. Yes, so there's effort. Effort again, really effort. Really give it a good... (laughs) And you think, do we need all of these books? And the answer is probably no. So if you... they can F off. Yes. If you you see a a series of books uh, and they're all pretty much variations on the same theme, my advice would be you either read the first one and just see if it's for you. But don't keep buying into the... No, it's a, it's quite interesting. I was probably going to mention this in the next episode, which is more about how to read a self-help book. But the Matt Haig books, I had the first two. I, and the weird thing about them is that I didn't like the first one, but I did actually find the second one useful because the second one seemed to me more practical. So the first one was more about his life and how depressed he was and how he got out of it. And, you know, I just couldn't relate to him, I don't think, in in that. So it was really difficult for me to go, okay, well, yeah, I can see how you got out of it and I can use that. It really wasn't like that at all. But the second one, the, the one which is notes on a busy planet or whatever it's called, because it was broken up into really small chapters and had some kind of interesting you know, interesting ideas about what you could do, you know, day to day. You know, it was a good book to actually read in the toilet, to be fair. You know, you go in in the toilet, yeah. read a chapter of it and go, yeah, I can use some of that. You know, there was something useful in it. But yeah. now we're on to three and four. And uh, I believe it, the, the new version of that, the comfort book that he has out, has been roundly panned for being ridiculous. I, I mean, I did, buy, I did buy one of them. I can't think what it, which one it was. I think it was the one that you didn't like. Because there were, there were some nice quotes in there, but reasons to stay alive was the first one. Yes. Notes on a nervous planet was the second one. That's the one I bought there, and, and there were some nice quotes in there. But I I got a lot more out of his fiction writing. Uh, the book The Humans I thought was a great book, uh, and I probably if that probably uh, made me think about the human condition more. So I found that much more uh, stimulating. Well, there's a couple of episodes there, isn't there, about what fiction can kind of tell you and and books that aren't essentially self-help books but make you think about, you know, the world in a, in a different way. Yeah, well, that's the – we mentioned last time bibliotherapy. That's the idea. It doesn't have to be a self-help book. It can be discussing the themes in – what's his name? The uh, I mean, it's Paolo Coelho who wrote The Alchemist. 
some of his books, uh, they're very simply written and there are a lot of them. Uh, but some of them are really profound, really make you think, you know, the moral dilemmas and uh, make you think about values. Those books can be incredibly valuable if you want to just think about your world. I think self-help books should have a practical basis. So as you've hit on, you've said the second book from Matt Haig was had a more practical emphasis. So that's probably where I see the benefit. I'm, we'll talk in the next episode some more of, you know, how to read a self-help book. My overall recommendation would be to always try and go for a book that is based on real research. It's based on some academic research. So I don't mean the research like from the Mars and Venus books, where it's based on, again, just the people who attended his workshops who had a lot of disposable income. And when I approach... Yeah, so the, those are the men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus books. And it actually isn't research. He's basically talked to people who had already signed up to his workshops, who already bought into the idea of it, and then were saying, yeah, it's fabulous. Why wouldn't you say it's fabulous after you'd spent a lot of money on it? The research indicates is that once we've committed, we're more likely to say, yes, it's fabulous, because we don't want to think we've been taken for a ride. Uh, yeah, so re- books that are based on research, the research has to be independent, doesn't it, and and qualified? Yes, because I'm aware it's been quite a, uh, oh, I think it's, I think it's been a bit of a, quite negative, but it, I think it's important to point out some of these obvious pitfalls uh, so you can know, OK, is this a book that's going to do me some good? Or is it a book that's going to make me feel a bit guilty? And I don't think guilt is a great re- great way to motivate people. Uh, so Martin Seligman, uh, he was very big in the positive psychology movement. Um, that's the academic aspect. No, it's not positive thinking, positive psychology. And he wrote a book called Learned Optimism. And so for all these, p- people often talk about themselves being, you know, half glass, uh, glass half empty or glass half full. <laughs> Half glass, means half, yeah. So, half glass, half concrete. Yeah, half glass, half concrete. Yeah, I've always got half a glass. Yeah, anyway. So, but he boils it down. So he, he's done lots of research and he's, he explains optimism in terms of the way we explain the world. It's an explanatory style. And he said, this is what optimists do. This is how optimists explain events. And this is how pessimists explain events. And pessimists often do things like if there's some good news happens or they do something good, they'll say it's a fluke. So they'll write off their positive achievements to a fluke. Hmm. If something bad happens, it's all, yeah, well, it's going to keep happening, isn't it? So we talk about, was it good news? Well, good news hasn't got a standard multipack like bad news. Bad news always comes in threes. So there are certain things that we do and they are obvious biases. And when we start to challenge the way we think about the world and challenge these biases, we can actually start to be a bit more optimistic. And so I think, you know, as someone who has periodically suffered from reactive depression, that had a profound effect on me. And it was based on decades of research. So if you can find the book that looks like it's based on decades of research, not, you know, I asked a few people in the workshops, oh, I shouted out the window at the builders. Yeah. Then you're more likely. And I built this around a weird metaphor. Yes, a, a, a metaphor that doesn't make sense. Men are from yeah. Mars, women are from Venus. You know, you're thinking, OK, they're different species then. How do they copulate? How do they reproduce <laughs> on their own planets? First of all, where are, where are dogs and cats from anyway? Is that another? <laughs> no, probably. Yes. That, there's a, yeah. there, there's where we can go with it. Well, we talk about dog people and cat people, and you think about their metaphors, and they suddenly become a reality. So you stop being a, a man, you start being from Mars, a Martian. And you see how easy we slide into this. So if you reject the metaphor at the start, a very simple metaphor that's obviously rubbish. The whole book falls apart. If you select a book based on research, the person would have interrogated these questions numerous times. So we're looking for something that's based solidly. So if you see books that are based in positive psychology by practitioners that have studied positive psychology or therapists 
I mean, we mentioned CBT last time. If it's got a cognitive behavioural model, there is some framework which means it has gone through some degree of testing, which also means that we're more likely to be able to take action from it rather than just think about it a bit. Okay. All right. That's useful to know. I think so. Therefore, you've got to think more about these books not being such an impulse purchase, but actually do a little bit of research before you buy one, which is an easier thing to do than it has ever been. Yes, it is. I mean, you just have a look online. I mean, we talk about little Yemeni didn't we last time (laughs) you did (laughs) well I did yes but the the idea that you know if a book looks like it's a little bit I wanted to say away with the fairies but you know that's probably a bit condescending if it looks like it's just wishful thinking or it's magical thinking there's nothing wrong with that indeed you know reading that kind of thing might actually make you happier for a short period of time but it's not research-based practical help for the issues that you have and taking action on some of those thoughts might be helpful and they might cause a shift in consciousness but it's better to take action on things that have been researched and we've got evidence on outcome studies so that's what i would want to know is what are your outcome studies is it just a straw poll of your people who've attended your workshops or is it research where people weren't necessarily going, paying to go uh, and didn't have a vested interest in saying, yes, it's a, it's a good thing because they'd paid so much and they didn't want to look foolish? Indeed. OK. I mean, I think judging the independent research from the other is going to be a little bit difficult because everything is going to, to be said to be based on some research or another, he said, as he creaks his chair forward. That wasn't the chair, was it? Tell the truth. In my knees. Oh, um, well, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking a bit higher. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, next time around, we will be telling you how to best read a self-help book, how to pick the one that's best for you and to get the most from it. And that's something to look forward to. It is indeed. Thanks again for joining us. That was and is Happiness, a Skeptic's Guide with Paul Flower and me, Gary Wood. Remember to hit the subscribe button wherever you find your podcasts so you'll be the first to know about new episodes. And if you've really enjoyed it, you can support the show at buymeacoffee.com forward slash skepticsguide.